Hello everyone and thank you very much for joining this talk today. Today I'm going to talk about the develop of, development of predictive models of forest disturbances across the Pacific Northwest of North America. My name is Nicholas Koops and I'm a faculty member at the University of British Columbia in forestry. And my co-author on this presentation is Professor Dick Waring, a professor who's now retired at Oregon State University. There's a great chance for the two of us to talk about this work and give you insights into these links between predictive models of growth of forests and stress and how we can then go and relate those to other data sources, for example, satellite imagery. So I'm going to talk about a lot of different components that make up this research today. So I will go through that slowly and revise those at the end to help bring these concepts together. But I guess the critical message from this presentation is over the last decade, we've seen some real advances into how we can monitor forest stress and forest disturbances. And we can do this from a number of different angles. We can do this from a modeling perspective through simple physiological models of forest growth. And we can also use current data on climate projections in terms of how climate data is changing and then link that to what we're actually seeing from space from our collection of satellite observations. So bringing together this availability of climate data, simple models and satellite observations, we can try to make prediction and then verify them from satellite observations over the landscape. So let me tell you a little bit about the project that myself and Dick Waring worked on. The underlying model that we use to predict forest disturbances and forest stress is the 3PG model. The 3PG model is a very simple forest physiological model, a very simple model to use. You can run it in Excel. We've got C++ versions. There are R versions. It's open, free, and accessible for anyone to download and use. And so it's a very easy model to apply to predict forest growth. It's based on physiology, which means we try to use basic, basic principles to predict how the forest will grow. We have radiation coming in from the sun. We have a forest canopy that then intercepts that radiation and produces carbohydrates. And we assign that carbohydrates to either foliage, stems, or roots. We have other meteorological information, for example, humidity and rainfall that also have an effect, as well as the ability of the plant to produce those carbohydrates based on soil conditions, water, and nutrients. So the basics of a physiological model are all incorporated in this very simple framework. The real benefit of 3PG is because it's so simple, we can run it over large areas. As many of you know, we've had this massive increase in spatial data that we can run models with. We have terrain models that give us slope and aspect. From slope and aspect, we can predict the radiation that we get from the sun. Using the position of slope on the landscape, we can work out the water availability in terms of the flow of the water across the landscape. So suddenly we can run these models at very fine spatial resolutions. Coupled with this real increase in our understanding of geospatial data, of course, is our understanding of climate data. And there's a large number of climate data sets we can now access that are also at fine temporal and spatial resolution. In this project, we used a climate model called w, uh, Climate WNA, which is based on the PRISM framework out of Oregon State University. And this allows us to input a DEM. We can input the um, position of where we are in the Earth through that DEM, the elevation, and then we can generate both past climate and future climate at a daily time scale. These can produce layers that then we can go away and put into models. So again, our ability to run these models over the landscape has really improved. Now, we all understand that climate is changing. And of course, these models give us spatial fine scale understandings of what's actually happening. So here we can just see from climate WNA, the climate differences we expect we are seeing over the Pacific Northwest. This is showing us changes in maximum temperature and minimum temperature from our long term mean defined as 1950 to 1975 compared to the recent decade of 1995 to 2005. And we can see, of course, temperatures are changing. We're seeing sites getting warmer associated with climate warming. So our maximum temperature is warming, especially in the north, although we're seeing pockets of fine scale variability where we're seeing a little bit of cooling in some states in the US. Perhaps critically, and what most of us know, is that the minimum temperature is also increasing and the minimum temperature is increasing faster than the maximum temperature. So many of our diseases and pests that, that are normally killed off at the end of each year with very, very cold temperatures, that's happening less often because our minimum temperatures are warmer. So these spatial layers go into 3PG. 
And what 3PG does is then look at how much the growth of the forest is being limited by the climate, how much it's being limited by the water, the humidity or the vapor pressure, the temperature and by frost. And I'm, I'm explaining this because we'll have some maps in a minute that will be scaled between zero and one so you understand the concepts, concept of modifiers. So 3PG produces these. We input our species specific information, a small table of species specific information into 3PG. And then 3PG then takes that climate data, that species information, that terrain information, and then runs itself over the landscape. 3PG is a monthly time step model. So we just need monthly climate to go and predict the past and future growth of the forest. So here, this is just for a generic tree species. We can see where there's major modifications to the growth. So for example, in temperature, in British Columbia, most tree species, when they're growing in summer, are not, mod are not impacted by temperature, but temperature is ideal. As we move further south, we get some species that start to be much more impacted by temperature in the summer. In soil water, for example, many places in British Columbia in the, in, along the coast are never water limited. But again, as we go into the southern part of the, U, into the US, we start to see at some point of the year, many species are drought impacted, at least at some point. So we can see that these modifiers provide information around when a particular climate modifier is going to be impacting a particular species. And I can do that broadly, or I can do that by species. So here we can see the predictions and growth of Douglas fir and lodgepole pine. Where it's red, it means that the species had the appropriate climate for that species to flourish all of the years between 1976 to 2006. So the long-term growth of the species, where it's red, it means the climate envelope for that species was ideal. Where we see different colors is where differing numbers of years would have added stress. And so whilst the species, of course, was still there in those years, the climate that that, experience, that, that species experienced, as modeled by 3PG, became suboptimal. So we can see some places where it's orangey and yellowy. Yes, Douglas fir might be there, but it's more stressed over that time period because the climate envelopes, as predicted by 3PG, didn't correspond to the long-term climate that we believe the species is adapted to. And so likewise, you can see the same effect on lodgepole pine. So we can overlay these distribution maps of the stresses of the species with the actual range of the species to then understand the stresses the species are under within their range. Okay, so this is from 3PG. Now let's think about what we can do from satellite imagery. A satellite that gives us an, a really good broad scale observation of what's happening to our forests is MODIS. MODIS is on the Terra and Aqua satellites and has been up since around 2000. And there are many different data products that we can derive from MODIS that allow us to go away and look at these forests. One is leaf air index which is also a variable that's predicted by 3PG. So by comparing satellite observations to model observations, I can already start to see how I might use these two in concert. On the left hand side is my predicted leaf area index from the long term climate from 3PG. On the right hand side is the modus leaf area index for 2005. Some areas, direct correspondence. Other areas, we start to see changes in what we believe the actual leaf area could be, as we see from MODIS, versus places what the physiological leaf area is predicted to be by the model. Now, one index that we can derive from MODIS is an index called the disturbance index. This is a very complicated graphic. And if you're more interested, the paper of where it came from is up there on the right by Namani and Running. And what it does is it compares the temperature of a pixel to the greenness with the idea that if that ratio of the temperature to the greenness varies in a negative or positive direction, we can tell what type of environment that pixel is under. So we can see in different quadrats, we have greenness on the x-axis and the temperature on the y. So obviously areas that are very low in greenness and very hot with a high surface temperature are going to occur at the top left. These are more indicative of our desert type environments that are water limited. In contrast, areas that are very high in DVI that are cool are more indicative of forests. And this variation in the temperature to the greenness along that axis actually has been used to define a disturbance trajectory. So here we can see schematically from the disturbance index paper that this approach was based on by Mildextra, we can see temperature, uh, I'm sorry, we can see time on the X axis and the disturbance index on the Y. If we track the pixel over time, as that ratio starts to increase or decrease, we're starting to see a pixel that's changed in its balance 
which can then be indicative of wildfire or other disturbances like insect. So we can take the stresses that we see from 3PG and we can compare those stresses with a disturbance index that we see from MODIS, which allows us to go away then and see, is there any correspondence between an observed disturbance and the stress that those trees were likely to be under? So we apply the model, the 3PG model, every single year from 1976 onwards. And that then tells us for which years the climate and the environment predicted by 3PG was optimum for the species. We count the number of years that it was not optimum, which then gives us an index of where the species is stressed within its range. And again, I've got species here of Douglas fir and Ponderosa pine. I can actually add that together for all the species that we modeled in the Pacific Northwest. So here you can see the proportion of species stressed from 3PG compared to baseline conditions. Orange pixels are telling us that in that pixel, the species was all of the species that we modeled were very stressed during the um, observation period compared to com compared to baseline conditions compared to species pixels that are blue where the species did not experience any major stress over that time. And the, the analysis period here, just reminding you, is, is 1995 to 2005. So we can then go and compare that to the MODIS index. So here's MODIS telling us pixels that have deviated from that ratio of greenness to temperature. These are pixels that are observed from space that are likely to have some type of disturbance occurring. And what I've done here is I've colored those by generic disturbances versus disturbances that are definitely not a fire. We know that it's a fire because we can use the MODIS hotspot to tell us whether the pixel was a hotspot fire. So generally, this is the map that tells us the disturbances over the landscape. And we then can compare those two, the disturbances that we predict from the models themselves. So here you can see a graph showing us by ecozone on the x-axis, the proportion of the ecozone that was stressed compared to three, based on 3PG, compared to the proportion of the ecozone that had pixels flagged as disturbed from MODIS. So on the x-axis, proportion of the ecosystem that was stressed. On the y-axis, the proportion of the ecozone that had pixels flagged as disturbed from MODIS. And we can see in general, there's a strong positive relationship. Ecozones that exhibited more stress from 3PG were ones that were more likely to have disturbed pixels. And those disturbed pixels could either be fire or they could be other types of disturbance, for example, infestations. This idea of linking satellite observations to what we actually see from a process-based model is really useful. And just to go and focus a little bit more on soil water, soil water is one of the most important variables we have to predict fire risk. And it's one variable we can easily go and predict from 3PG. But the variable we don't know when we think about predicting soil water is how deep is the soil to hold that water. So we can predict how stressed we think the plant is, but we did have to give the depth of the soil water bucket to the model for it to go away and make that prediction. So one of the real benefits of linking a satellite observation to the 3PG observations is we can set those together and then allow the depth of that bucket to change. And we can essentially do a sensitivity analysis. We can say, if MODA says the leaf area is six, run 3PG, changing the depth of the soil water until it predicts a leaf area of six. And once we get the corresponding leaf area, then set that as the soil water holding capacity. So here you can see on the left hand side again, the predicted LAI, the observed LAI from MODIS. And then on the right hand side is the predicted soil water that we think the landscape can hold by making the leaf area from the satellite correspond to the leaf area from the model. So that's a unique approach to use satellite observations with models to go and infer these critical environmental variables like soil water. So in summary, these hybrid approaches of using models and then comparing them with observations from satellites allow us to get key insights in terms of what's happening in the landscape. And in this case, we've really focused on these disturbance patterns that we're able to see from space. Remote sensing can see that stress and these physiological models can help us understand what's causing that stress. For example, drought. And that then is a key indicator that might inform upon fire. 
I can be reached at nicholas.coops at ubcca if you'd like to follow up and get copies of papers that summarise this work. Thank you very much for listening.